Uh, for, I'm Mark Stanislav. Uh, I'm usually at Rubicon, Shmoocon, Nauticon, so I'm around. Um, today I'm going to kind of go over what I've learned in a few semesters, let's call it four, of teaching. I've taught at Eastern Michigan University in ITT Tech. Um, so I'm just going to kind of share today some stories on what I've learned, what I've seen, what I hate, ITT Tech, um, and just other problems with education or just things that you might run into. Uh, is anyone looking to go into education, adjunct lecturer, pro professor, adjunct? adjunct? Already or Senior. going? Sir, already? Okay, so you're going to just laugh at me and be like, this kid doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, so, uh, different experiences. It's kind of cool going to ITT Tech and teaching there and also teaching at a public university like Eastern Michigan because there are a lot of dif uh, differences. The disparities are pretty obvious once you start doing it at two different places. Um, so we're just going to kind of run over those today and a couple other things. Um, this is, I, th I would have said this would have been my best slide, but I have one I just added, so wait for it. So if anyone's a big fan of the lens flare, boom, lens flare. I actually just had my birthday, um, so the presentation topic is kind of disingenuous now. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually 25, so it's no longer interesting. Um, that was my best slide. Here's currently my best slide. Um, <laughs> I just couldn't help myself when I was watching the last presentation. That thing was amazing. Uh, did anyone see them at uh, ShmooCon or any other conference they did? Oh, you guys are missing out. Um, so there's my zombie kitty for the presentation. So my background, i uh, kind of a jack of all trades in some ways. PHP developer, InfoSec, uh, did entrepreneur thing for a little while. My big thing that I usually do is Linux administration, Unix administration in general. Um, and the newest one I added to my, my list was adjunct lecturer. Uh, my background's in networking IT administration. I'm doing network security, my master's currently, uh, both from Eastern Michigan. So uh, today's topic is adjunct lecturer. Some of this is gonna be supporting, obviously, because what I teach my students is slightly relevant to what I've learned myself. So, uh, it's one of those things where, was it from Fight Club? Uh, it's only until you've lost everything that you're free to do anything, right? When I decided to leave my startup out of nowhere, I got rid of my full-time job to do the startup. I had no, no real agenda. I was free to do whatever. And one of the reasons I started my master's degree was so that I could teach eventually. Funny story, it turns out you can do that before you get your master's even. Um, so when I left the startup, I just kind of did, you know, resume spam, application spam, whatever. Um, ITT Tech, they had some jobs on monster.com, took a look there, applied for those, whatever. Turns out a week later I already had a new job, um, so that was kind of a nice turnaround, especially for Michigan, especially for this economy. So my opportunity slightly went away, right? I wasn't, I wasn't really looking anymore, but um, I got hired at ITT Tech a few days later. Things happen in one very, very thin cluster, which is kind of cool because you're not waiting around hoping. It just kind of happened. Um, I got lucky, honestly. So uh, I was hired at EMU six days after that. This I'll get into and in how all this kind of fell into place, but it, again, very interesting timeline. And three months later, roughly, uh, I started teaching at EMU, and then a couple days later, I started teaching ITT Tech. So. Um, this September, a lot changed for me. I ran into something that I had pr no prior experience with. I'd done training, I had done you know, basic education with the jobs and with Eastern before, but never, I was never a lecturer. I, I never taught a class, I never had a curriculum. So, um, I'm gonna get started with ITT Tech since that's kind of the first thing that fell into my plate. Uh, is anyone, I, I know Matt over here goes to ITT Tech, does anyone else have affiliations or had been, Zach? Anyone else, ITT Tech instructor or anything? Okay, um, <laughs> my, my opinion's not gonna be hidden very quickly. So um, yeah, so I got an opportunity. I applied for two positions with them. One was for an adjunct spot to be a Linux, ad, or a Linux instructor, and the other one was to do a full-time position for information security. Um, at the time, you know, I was looking for anything. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. By the time they called me, um, a couple things were apparent. I had a full-time job now, a few days later, and I wasn't really, I, I don't think they were really looking to have me do a full-time spot, because they obviously do want some background, they want some kind of education um, experience, so. Uh, the resume got me an interview for both, teaching experience may be eligible for one. So basically they said, 
you know, we can't hire you for a full time. We know you're not looking for a full time anymore. So what do you think about doing an adjunct? So I was like, yeah, okay, we can, we can take a look. So they kind of went over the curriculum and what I'd be teaching, how, how it works. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds okay. Um, it's kind of the foot in the door mentality, right? You don't think you can get maybe the best job in the world, but as long as you get an opportunity to show what you can do, hopefully you can expound upon that at a later date, make something you know, big happen. Um, let's see. So <laughs> the next few slides are gonna be about the ITT tech process, what it's like, some of the things I ran into. <clears throat> Here's a disclaimer time. Uh, Eastern Michigan University did not send me here. My, my company that I work for, which we'll call Pro Promotions Company in Detroit, they did not send me here. ITT Tech sure as hell did not send me here. Um, I should just say up front, this is probably obvious at this point, after I taught a semester there, I declined to teach there further. So I haven't worked there since this uh, past fall. I never will again. And all views expressed are surely my own. I know that nothing I say will be good with IT tech, and some of the things I say might be questionable with people I work with. So, um, moving on. The, getting the IT tech job demo lesson plan. They told me, hey, we want to see that you can actually teach, that you can put words together and form a sentence and say something technical that impresses us, right? So, five minute demo. Technically speaking, for five minutes, and getting content out there to someone is pretty hard, right? You have to, any, any tech lecture, any, even if you're gonna tell your friend like, okay, how to set up a basic network, it takes more than five minutes. Um, that's why we're in IT, it's a complicated thing, we spend a lot of time working on it and, and perfecting our craft. To, to take five minutes is pretty harsh. Um, but I made something about network IDS, uh, host-based IDS, put some slides together, put some funny shit in there, they liked it. Three important people, they showed up halfway. Two and a half minutes into a five minute presentation. I basically had two and a half minutes to convince the people that were actually going to hire me. I had one guy that was in there that had really nothing to do with the hiring process. He was just kind of there to observe. Um, he's the one I talked to for the first two and a half minutes. So I had two and a half minutes to impress the people that actually made the decision. That's quite the timeline. Um, <laughs> this was awesome. I was criticized for not moving around. And just to point out, so I'm basically boxed in like this in front of them. They gave me no remote, they gave me nothing to walk around with, they, I, I didn't have my iPhone hooked up like this. Um, and the guy that said that was there for two and a half minutes. In two and a half minutes, I didn't impress him enough by walking around, I, I don't know. Um, they have some weird criteria, they have some weird focuses at ITT Tech. Um, they're, more about, they're more about show, and I think the reason why is because the people they're hiring, generally speaking, aren't either technically sound or they're not proficient in what they're teaching. So they want, they want you to be the interactive guy. They want you to be the nice guy, the guy that walks around and shakes hands. That's not education, that's fluff. But that's what they want. So that's the, that's the one thing they docked me on when I did an interview, everything else went fine. So I still got the spot, they just didn't approve of it. Um, hired soon after, I, I guess because I spoke English, I was breathing at the time and they figured I would be later and I confused them enough about network IDS and host-based IDS. Um, you, sometimes we talk about teaching the lowest common denominator. Trying to impress ITT tech staff is not hard. Um, they, I don't know how they manage that stuff, but whatever. Orientation day, this is when things start going downhill. Yes, day one before I even start teaching, things are going downhill. Uh, this is also the day that I knew that I would never teach here again without even teaching. Students are customers first and students second. Money. We have shareholders to think about. ESI, which is the parent company, is public. Help make sure people pass to the next class. This sounds pretty altruistic, right? You want people to pass classes, you want them to do well. No, they want you to pass classes because in certain situations, they have to refund you money if you don't pass the class. They want you to progress people because they know dropout rates are higher when people don't pass a class. It's not about getting an education, it's about... <laughs> How did that go backwards? There we go. Yes. And the last one, which really, the, the top ones infuriated me. <laughs> These students pay $43,000 
for an associate's degree. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so instructor tasks at ITT Tech. A student missed class, you are supposed to personally call them that night. And by the way, these classes, at least the ones I taught personally, uh, these classes run one time a week, four and a half hours, okay? You start class about 6, 6.30, you finish class 10, 10, 30, 11, somewhere in there, depending on what's going on. Um, so they want you to either A, stop class, call the two or three people that missed class, or B, wait until 10, 10, 30, 11 p.m. to call students. I don't see how either of those are realistic. Um, I had to do it a few times because I started getting, you know, like, oh, you're not calling people. I'm like, I'm teaching. You hired me to teach. Why am I calling people mid-class? They're like, well, you could call them after. I'm like, no one's going to pick up the phone at 11 p.m., dude. It's just not going to happen. Print, this one's kind of a, it's more annoying and frustrating and paper waste than anything. They have an online grade book, but the students don't get access to the online grade book. So instead, I have to print, I had roughly 30 students. You have to print 30 copies, then, of a grade sheet, which might have two to three pages, three times a semester, and the semester is 12 weeks long. So you're basically sitting around printing stuff out, wasting paper, and the students are just like, well, this is kind of out of date. I'm like, I know it is, but that's what they want me to do for you. Why don't you just look at the grades online? And that's when the students said, oh, we can't do that. I'm like, why not? And they're like, because they said it's a security risk. Okay. <laughs> you have to take attendance every week without, within one hour of start time. Um, the, the time that I didn't take attendance within an hour, I had someone come into class, interrupt me mid-lecture, and, and ask me, well, why, why isn't your attendance in? I'm like, oh, I, I was focused on teaching. Sorry, I'll do this later. And they're like, no, we, we need you to do this now. I'm like, what, what's going to happen? I, and this is outside. I'm not saying this in front of the class. I'm like, what's going to happen if you know, it's an hour or two or, or, or if it's 10 PM? And she's like, well, depending on when they miss class and how long they're there and why they're missing class, uh, we'd like to talk to them and see if we can counsel them. And I'm like, why, why don't you do this then? Why am I, why am I calling them? Why, why aren't you taking attendance for me? I don't understand why I'm doing all these things for you. Um, you're, you're not, and this is one common theme, you're not a instructor at ITT Tech, you're supposed to be a babysitter. If you speak to a student about missing a class or have a problem, create a report about it. Now, report is kind of vague, obviously. Their reporting software was this bastardized Java app. Um, you had to, you know, log in with your credentials, go in, search for the student. Once you find the student, you have to go through like four or five different tab screens to actually get to the report. And you have to select a drop down and pick why you're doing it and when it is and when you talk to them and what the result of that talk was. This is if they miss a class one day. Now, four or five students, one, one or two come in late, two or three are sick. Um, you had one person that had to leave early. Now you have, what, five, six reports to do. These each probably take about 10 minutes to accomplish. Okay? Important information is designed by the curriculum board. Um, I, as an instructor, being that they don't really care to hire extremely proficient people, we don't have a say in really the curriculum that's being offered. There is ITT corporate, right? There's a big umbrella. Um, if you go to a campus in Michigan, where I taught, and you go to a campus in Arizona, they want you to go and get the same experience at each one. It's not about being creative. It's not about inspiring people. It's not about taking what you've learned in your life and applying it to people to, to get them involved. It's about reading off a document and collecting a paycheck and them collecting a shit ton of money. <laughs> this, one, this one I had a nice argument with on the last week of class with, with one of the administrators. Um, if a student doesn't have homework, and we're talking, like, we're talking like a half percent of their entire grade for a semester or a quarter, um, if they don't have homework, you're supposed to ask them to leave class. These people are paying $43,000 for a fucking associate and you want me to ask them to leave class? Who, like, really, at what point do you get off to say that we're going to make adults, we're going to make people that are ready for this industry for, for really bad times in the economy, and we're going to kick them out of class? It's just, it's asinine. Curriculum. Course packed is gospel. You're not allowed to change the order of weeks. They give you this nice thick document you're supposed to print out. You print it out. It says, week one, do this, tell kids this. Week two, do this, tell kids this. What's important is determined by ITT Tech. 
And they don't update this very regularly either. Um, I think once every two years is pretty much the status quo. Instructors do not make the final exam. You're not allowed to change the questions on the final exam. You give the final exam as it is written. If you think the final exam isn't teaching or isn't, isn't bringing out what it should as far as assessing, which again, tests are to made, made to assess, right? It's not made to pass or fail people. It's made to make sure people are aware that you were making them aspire to be, right? Um, I can't, I can't change the final. How am I supposed to assess my students in the way that I was teaching them? You can't give extra credit. Um, it's, it's just a no-no. Um, I taught Linux. Uh, I know Linux isn't the topic of this conversation, but Fedora 9 is what the class was based on. First off, Fedora is, if, if you guys aren't familiar, Fedora is a community-driven thing. Um, it's mostly made for the desktop. There's something called CentOS, right? And that's the server, the enterprise level. We're teaching kids how to use desktop level software, right? Um, the Fedora that we use was released uh, May 13th, 08. Fedora 11, two versions later, was released in June, uh, June 9th. They could have easily updated the curriculum. They had three months to update the curriculum. And everyone that knows Linux, especially basic Linux, was, which is what I was really teaching them, uh, screenshots might change, uh, a, a, a command parameter might change, but at the core of it, you're just being lazy if you don't update that kind of curriculum, and they are lazy. So, here's my rip-off math slide. Um, you will see that blue little thing at the bottom left. That's my pay. I got paid $1,600 for a quarter. One single student for that one class is paying $1,350. They basically pay for my job, right? Um, that one student. Student class sizes are, on average, per ITT tech, 20 to 30 students. I had 28 in my class. This is just based on 25. 25 students nets, uh, or I, I should say grosses, $33,750. You pull my pay out of there, and you have a, a, a top line profit, at least, of $32,150. You might go, well, yeah, universities make a lot of money too, though, right? And you know, there's, there's a lot going on, and they, I'm sure they have to pay a lot of people. There, there's one building. There's not a campus. You don't have a sports team at IT Tech. You don't, you don't have major research facilities at IT Tech. You have one shitty-ass building off Big Beaver Road in Troy, Michigan, that you, you go past and you're like, oh, is that the, the oh, no, that's the post office. Where, where is this building? That's the experience you get when you go to IT Tech. It's just off the road somewhere. It's not some huge uh, community-driven thing. There's one IT guy for the entire building. There's a handful of administrators. I'd probably say five or six administrators, really. Um, the equipment sucked. It was really bad. I mean, like Dell GX 240s a couple of months ago. I mean, this is old equipment. They're not, they're not throwing gobs of money to make the best possible experience for these people. Um, the money doesn't add up, right? Um, it's adding up in someone's pocket. It's adding up in, in some, some guy that's making a shit ton of money right now. It's not adding up to the students. It's not adding up to the instructors. Your entire staff is mostly comprised of, comprised of people like me. The adjunct that teaches one class uh, every, every couple quarters. Um, if you're making that much top line profit and the amount of stuff you have to do for overhead to run those courses is so low, where's, where's it all going? <laughs> this should be a good summary. Uh, you don't have to know what you're speaking about. You're supposed to babysit your students to pass the class. They're not making you adults. They're not, they're not educating you to be thinkers. They're not, you know, some, there's something to be said about even just academics in general. If, if you don't maybe learn, learn an entire major top to bottom, you know, don't get a job right out of school, you probably at least really learned to learn. You probably at least had some, had some really deep conversations with people that have spent years in academia. You had some, uh, some personal growth. That's not what you're getting in IT. You're missing out on a ton of things. And I'm not saying anything about, you know, like a public education versus private. It's not about that. It's, it's if you're paying that much money and you're sacrificing so much and, and you're not getting so much in return, what's the point? I mean, what's, what's the real tangible point of going to a place like that? If a student skips half the, qu half the quarter, which again is only 12 weeks, uh, the 12th week is technically, well, I should say 12 weeks is actually wrong. 12 weeks is for the instructors. The 12th week is an in in-service, which is really sitting around and just talking about how great everyone is in administration. Um, the 11th week is finals, so really 10 weeks, yeah? 
So 10 weeks, I had a student that missed five weeks. And I, I asked like, well, you know, you have a policy that if a student misses, I think it's three consecutive classes, they automatically fail. But if they say go to one, miss two, go to one, miss two, they don't fail. <laughs> I don't know why that makes sense, but it does to them. Um, I was told to pass the student. You missed five out of 10 classes, the grades are deplorable, easily should have failed, turned in homework late even when they came to class, I was told to pass them. And when I submitted my final grades, I sent it, this was after they knew I wasn't coming back, I submitted my final grades. Um, they actually confirm your grades. You don't submit your grades as an instructor, as the person that decides that. You submit, you submit your grades and they certify them, which means they can go in and change whatever the hell they want at any time. <laughs> Instructors get great uh, bonuses for grades in their class. They get bonuses for attendance. The bonuses are menial at best. They're a couple hundred bucks, I think. Um, but what it does, you have an incentive to inflate numbers. If you're making 1,600 bucks for a semester or a quarter, which I mean isn't a whole lot of money. Uh, for me, it was more about the experience than it was about money, right? Um, if you're making people that maybe don't have great jobs or they are in between jobs or the economy just hit them really hard. Why wouldn't they inflate those numbers? Morality, sure, but what, what is it to, to say that 5% one way or the other on one student that gets you that bonus for $200 or $400 is really that, really that hurtful to education? You shouldn't have to make those choices in education. You shouldn't have to make concessions on, do I want more money or do I want to have like some high morality line of this student shouldn't pass and I'm actually going to do that. Those aren't decisions educators should have to make in a reasonable institution. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of the ITT tech for the night probably. Um, you guys all know my opinion on it. Um, I earnestly mean all those things. I'm not just here to bash them. I'm here to talk about general education. That's, I, I really had to get that off my chest more than anything. Um, so, during teaching, you get people, it's kind of like the kids that say the darndest things area. Um, you get a lot of people that say a lot of funny things randomly in classes. Some of these are nerd-centric, some of these are Linux-centric, so yeah, I, hope, I hope everyone can appreciate at least a little comedy today. Uh, people do find happiness in the weirdest of places. Why doesn't it just help check config, not man check config? Why do they make it the least sensible thing possible? To be fair, help is a real command, but with check config, it's not going to give you actual help output. One minute later from the same student. But I love running cat debu random. It's fun to watch. <laughs> now, for those of you that don't know what the hell cat debu random does or what it means, this is what running cat debu random does. People find happiness in weird places. <laughs> oh, there's another quote in here, in, uh, in here for him. Um, so, how is the higher EMU? This is a lot more, uh, <laughs> this is like a love story to me. It's ju it just seems too perfect in this way. Um, EMU, um, we have a lot of cool programs which I'm gonna go into and just kind of give a once, once over about kind of what we do at EMU that makes us a place I'm proud to work. But uh, as an undergrad, I had a great relationship with my program head. Really good guy, he came from corporate. He used to work for J. Walter and Thompson, um, Borders Group, he was a very high up in both companies, has a huge background. Um, this isn't just an academic that read a, a bunch of books about TCP headers and came back to teach. This guy has worked the industry, at, knows everything top to bottom for business and for technology. It's a great person to have lead you. Uh, he found out I was going to be teaching ITT Tech. Um, I remember having a conversation with him. Uh, it was, I was actually in his grad class, and he had a conversation with me, and he's like, oh, you're, you're teaching there? That's cool. He's like, why aren't you teaching here? I'm like, well, I, I'm, I'm getting my master's degree to teach here. He's like, why don't you teach now? I'm like, god damn it, why did I start that math? No. Um, <laughs> so EMU needed someone to take over Intro to Linux. Um, just to kind of extrapolate my background a little more, uh, I, I, I've been using Linux for 12 years, FreeBSD, all that stuff. Um, I, I used to work at University of Michigan Dearborn. I was a Unix admin there. I did an IT startup where I was the guy that did a hardened Linux system. And now I currently work for a digital promotions company in Detroit which I'm a Linux administrator there. Um, we, over the Super Bowl, we did four million page views in two hours. So I, I have a little bit of background in Linux and, and running it and doing that stuff. Um, I, I certainly didn't want to read out of a curriculum booklet to tell me how to teach Linux. 
So um, there was an opportunity, right? Most things are opportunity, you gotta jump on them. Uh, he knew my background um, because I did undergrad with him. That's one of those things that when you're going through school, I, I, think, I think, and I'm gonna get to this later, I think a lot of students have a really high level of respect for the people instructing them in general, I really do. Um, it, it's, it's something more to really make an impact and it goes back to the networking and everything else like these conferences. You never know who's gonna be able to help you out. And always make good impressions, always, always uh, be humble, always be respectful of people. And because I did good work when I was an undergrad, I was just doing the work because it was my undergrad, right? Um, but because I put, my, I put effort into it, I cared about it, and he could tell that, he knew I was capable. It's pretty rather, it's really rather simple. Um, it, it wasn't a whole lot, it wasn't something I, I you know, painstakingly worked at or, or petitioned the school to let me teach. It just kind of happened. Um, you need to set yourself up for those opportunities, though. So, um, Eastern Michigan University, we are an NSA Center of, for Academic Excellence. Uh, just to give you scope on what that means, really, uh, in Michigan, there are three schools that are fit to that credential. In, I know in Ohio, because I looked you guys up really quick, um, I'm, I'm saying that because everyone is in Ohio currently, um, there's two schools in Ohio that are that, so it's not something that every other school on your block has or every other university has obtained. Uh, we uh, have certification for national IA education and training, and our courses are mapped to CNSS agency standards 4011, 4012. I'm sure that means something really impressive. Uh, but we, we have credentials behind us. Uh, we're not just kind of out there. We, we, have, you know, we have our basic computer science. We have our basic CIS programs. Um, the department I work for, College Technology, we do some pretty cool stuff. On the undergrad side, there's an applied information assurance, information assurance management, a crypto program. My major was networking and IT administration. I would have been one of those top three, but uh, that wasn't around when I was under, undergrad. And at graduate level, we have information assurance in a, in a broader sense, um, network uh, security kind of segment of uh, IA. And then we also have digital investigations. We have some people that have spent part of their lives doing digital forensics and um, you know, they're certified you know, with, uh, with FTK and, and CASE and all those. Uh, so we have, we have some really knowledgeable people. Um, I'm usually pretty humbled to be on the same staff as them. So that's great. Um, on to the general teaching stuff, right? So creating lab exercise. This is, where, this is where my humility at not really appreciating most people that have ever taught me started happening. Um, you really don't realize how, how much labor goes into making a curriculum. You don't realize how much effort goes into even grading or just keeping track of people's schedules or helping them do something. It's a lot of work. Uh, so this is gonna be kind of obvious, but just as an overview. Um, you know, get a general idea of what you want to teach. If you're going to teach a, a class about DNS, figure out, well, yeah, DNS is great and all, and you can run bind, but do you want to talk about DJB DNS? Do you want to, do you want to bring up um, why the RFC says what it says? What do you want to cover? Because in most cases, in at least my class, um, I generally have about an hour, hour and a half of lecture tops, and the rest of the time is lab, right? So you really kind of have to streamline what you're looking at. You have to scope it out um, in enough a way to to fill up lab time, but remember when you fill up lab time, you kind of have to appreciate that not everyone's gonna be your star pupil, and especially that not everyone's gonna be you. No one's gonna be you, probably. Um, so you, you take things, not how quick you can do them, or quick, quickly you can do them, you take into account, what if the network goes down for a few minutes? What if someone's virtual machine doesn't start up? These things happen, and you need to, uh, you need to add in time for that kind of uh, prepare, preparedness. Run through your exercise knowing what steps are. So basically, if I'm, if I'm a tech guy, right, I'm just gonna be like, I wanna install this service, I already know how to do it, so I'm gonna start doing the steps, start doing it, knock it out, put some notes down. Once you get your notes down, add in co content to fit your timeline. Um, some, some lab exercises I did, even, I, even while I was doing them, they would take me like two hours. I'm like, there's no way this is gonna happen. Drill it down, I would try to fill up about what I was expecting, um, if I was expecting maybe an hour and a half, Maybe I would do an hour. Um, that way, that hour with a 30 minute buffer, if something went wrong or, or I had a student that got really stuck or had a problem with their computer or whatever, that would give me time to help and give them time to complete the lab. Uh, test your altered lab exercise, take more notes, test again. Um, this time, follow it as written. You might, you might get confident that, well, yeah, I've gone over this step twice. I've written things wrong that I thought I wrote right, and then had I not tested it again, it would have blew up in 30 students' faces, which if you've got, 
when or if you've ever been in a class where a lab just wasn't working because the professor messed it up or you messed it up, um, things go downhill pretty quick. And just repeat, um, test it a couple times. Uh, the nice thing about doing development with a virtual machine, doing Linux curriculum, is I have the opportunity to do everything in a VM, take snapshots, revert, go back, this and that. Um, sweet. Uh, and make sure that what I'm working on will, uh, you know, get, get everyone to the same point in a consistent manner and not get them frustrated along the way. You don't want to frustrate people learning Linux for the first time. Um, most people are already frustrated learning Linux the first time, right? So building curriculum, uh, this is just a lot of hours and a lot of just, just it, it's going to really dry you out um, on, as far as your ability to care about this topic anymore almost. I suggest you do this not before you just start doing the, the semester. Um, I had to do a class over Christmas because I was picking it up. So I had two weeks to update my current curriculum for my, under, for my intro class and completely create a whole new curriculum in about two weeks. I was on my couch watching every episode of every TV show I ever had recorded, um, just typing, working, uh, testing um, as quickly as I could, basically. 11 labs, fully tested, probably about 25 hours, right? Uh, that might even be kind of an underestimation. Quizzes and final, it, it sounds so simple, like, yeah, this guy took 10 minutes to write a fucking quiz. What? No, you have to think about what you've covered, what you covered in a way that isn't unfair to your students. If you said something one time in a lecture, it's, it, it, depending on who you are, it's not really fair to be, expect that student to remember the most menial detail about your lecture. You might think it's important, but if you didn't make it a point, if you didn't make it important, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't expect them to really, really focus on that. Um, final exam, probably about 50 questions. I, I have a practical side for my advanced class um, and then kind of a written component too. Class project, each, each class I have, the intro and advance, I had a class project, they differed quite highly between them. Um, but you have to take time to scope it out. You have to take time to figure out how it's gonna work into your semester long schedule to make sure they have time to prepare for it. <laughs> PowerPoint slides. Um, this is a really low number only because how I do my PowerPoints. My PowerPoints, I do a, a slide by slide for a step by step of the lab. By the time they go to do the lab, they've already seen it gone through in, in, in PowerPoint. Um, what this helps prevent is people from making really stupid mistakes that last them a long time and they get frustrated with, because the point of education is not to frustrate, it's to make people understand, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you think it's necessary to use PowerPoint as a, as a necessary tool for people rather than, you know, like, simply what it is, it's a tool? Right, great question. So I'll uh, just repeat for the, um, well, my, my video history. Um, he was asking, is, is PowerPoint really a, basically a necessary evil? Do you, do you really need to use it or can you just... Get, get away without using it. For Linux, um, with people that really don't have a lot of experience, it is great, so, like really, really great for people to have PowerPoint slides. They can download, look at it at home, and go, okay, here's my, here's my terminal, here's the other terminal. Oh, this is wrong, I got it. it it's that kind of um, visual keys. And one thing I learned about um, teaching, and, and I, I have done research on actually education and teaching, not just, oh, I'm gonna go talk about Linux. Um, Learn, there's, there are quite a few different types of learners. And you really have to kind of, you have to appreciate that not everyone learns the way you do. You have to appreciate that 30 students might learn one way and one student might learn another way. Give everyone a chance. Um, if you, so something like uh, talking about hard links, right? Hard links or soft links, sim links, whatever. You can talk about it all day. You can show them how it works. But until you put like, a couple blocks on a PowerPoint slide and show that, oh hey, hard links, everything points to the same spot in your hard drive. Until someone sees that visually, they might not have a clue what you're talking about. So um, for me, the PowerPoints have been invaluable because the students take them after the class and they can look at them and, and, and work on their lab if they have problems or whatever else. New syllabus, uh, about two hours to write that. Uploading content to online courseware, not because my I have like a 56K, just because you have to label everything, make sure it gets uploaded up, to the right account, multiply that by a couple classes. It takes time. Uh, semester long lesson plan. The lesson plan aspect, you have your curriculum, right? You have your, your labs and uh, you have your basic lecture ideas or whatever. You still have to organize it on a calendar. The calendar changes every semester. You know, Easter falls on a different month, this and that. Uh, you can't just copy and paste semester to semester. Um, and then maybe you have a day off or maybe you're sick. You have to account for these things. You don't want to be uprooted because you, you suck at planning. You want the students to feel like you put enough time into this that 
no matter what comes up, you're going to handle that issue and make them feel like, yeah, he's, he, he's in charge, he knows what's going on, and he's not just half-assing this. Because when, when, whenever you half-ass, if it's work or school or whatever, when you half-ass something, people take notice, they lose respect for you, and they stop listening. Researching chapters, um, kind of cool. Uh, I don't have books for my classes. We have something called Books 24-7. It's kind of like the Safari online, right? Um, I go through, get publications that they all, all have access to online. I give them the pages, chapters that they can look at. They don't have to buy three books that are you know, $200 worth, and they can still get the same content if they need it. My labs are designed that whatever you, you hear in class, whatever you see on the slides, whatever you, see, whatever you do on the lab, that's what I want you to know. If you need extra help, if you need extra guidance, I'll give you um, information to do that. And creating the binder, grading sheets, extras, you just throw on another four hours. So you might have spent 40, 50, 60 hours. You've made zero dollars. Um, the validity of this is one to two semesters if you actually care. Um, if you're, you know, if you're waiting two, two years or, or uh, yeah, maybe two years for curriculum updates, you're missing out on a ton of features, you're missing out on content that should be integrated. Most importantly, by not up updating your curriculum, you're really, I mean, if it's not obvious, you're robbing your students of what they've paid for. <laughs> so preparing the curriculum before the semester gives you sanity and students better education. Um, one guy I talked to, really nice guy, but he was like, yeah, just you know, get a couple weeks done, and then you know, work from there. I feel like if you do that, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing a snapshot of what you want to accomplish. If you work to, to get the whole scope of what you want to accomplish, I think you're, you're going to present that information better. I think students are going to pick up on it easier, because when you're skipping around, you ever had that math teacher that like, has you going through like 30 different places in a math book, and like, oh yeah, uh, I kind of forgot to bring up that you have to know tangents and stuff, and I, I know calculus is hard, but man, if you could just look, just, just bear with me. It's that kind of thing that makes people frustrated. <laughs> it makes them not want to come back to class. It makes them want to write letters to your dean. Um, so be prepared. You have to keep it current to teach IT and not suck. We are super dynamic, and you want, have, you want to have a good experience. You want people to feel like what I'm learning actually matters. New, o, new OS release, for my case, retest labs, update screenshots. Uh, and a good curriculum makes students feel progress. You want them to know they're learning. You want them to know that they're accomplishing things, that what they're doing is not in vain, that what they're doing is going to, they're going to have huge takeaways for sitting in class with you and listening for two hours. Um, so here's an example lab. Uh, explanatory title, don't make them go into it thinking like, what the hell is today? Lab one, I, I'm, I'm glad that there's an iteration, but what the hell does lab one mean? Logical section structure, um, just up there, configuring VMware, installing CentOS and solar, blah, blah, blah. When you guys ever read a book, and some, some, I'm sure some of you can just knock out a book in minutes, <laughs> but when I read a book, I would read chapter to chapter, and that was my goal, to get to the next chapter when I, when I first started really reading. Um, having having a, a kind of like a progress meter, it makes you feel good, it makes you feel confident in the work you're doing. If you break it up into sections like that, even if the student only gets to the end of section one, they're like, I got section one done, not I got bullet point number 27 done. It, it doesn't give that feeling of progress. Concise sentences, don't ramble and ramble and ramble on it. Um, it <laughs> don't change fonts everywhere, which way. Um, most of my fonts up there um, are when they actually have to hit a button or, or click something just so they know there's a key right there. Um, build upon earlier labs. Again, with the progress thing, bring up something, bring up something better, bring up something bigger. No plain text formatting. Please just don't type shit in text pad and throw it at your student and be like, hey, here's what I worked on for 10 minutes. If you, at least if you get this, you know I care. You know, you know I put time into it. You know I thought it out. You know I, you know I bro broke it up in a way that I thought would help you. Commands, change the font. Um, I change the font. I, I italicize them. Because when you're doing Linux commands and someone that hasn't done Linux before, there's a lot of things in Linux that look like they're just words in the sentence. Break it up. Make, make sure they know what they're doing. Uh, reasonable length. Don't make a lab. Make a lab that they can finish. Don't make a lab because you want to feel like, oh yeah, they, they're not working up to their standard. You're not working up to an education standard. If you make people fail because you want to make something long and convoluted, you're not educating people. And get to the fucking point. Just get, get something out of that class. Don't make them feel like when they leave there, all right, I, I got this. I know how to LF better than anyone's ever LS'd before. Um, <laughs> presentation slides. I, I, this is my way. 
Uh, and this really works for my kind of curriculum. It probably doesn't work for many other people's. Um, highlight the certain output. I don't do this right now, but it's a great thing, and I usually do it uh, by pointing at shit. Take time to red box stuff. When, when students are looking for, did I do this right? You might have a huge buffer of output, especially in Linux. Box the thing that actually matters. Uh, if you're doing a, if you're doing a D message, box the part that says your kernel's panicked. Um, if that's what they're looking for, you know, don't make them be like, well, the device loaded and my my Sound Blaster 16 is up there. I don't see what the problem is. Um, focus on benefit of a uh, given task in relation to how it gets the student closer to finishing. Um, if you're doing like Apache, you've added this module. You didn't just add it because I told you to. You added it to add SSL support. Emphasize uh, critical slides and segue into larger uh, lecture topics. Everything you say in class doesn't have to be about the lab. It's not about teaching everything. Um, I segue all the time. I usually try to keep on point, but I segue into things that are interesting or, or they might like to talk about. Um, so like when I was doing SE Linux, we had a you know, basic lab. Here's how you enable it, disable it, context, just some overview stuff, right? Um, I segued into, you know, these are mandatory access controls. That's different from discretionary access controls because of this. And, you know, this is at a kernel level, and this is the user has control, and this is how it stacks. Um, you know, give them something else. All right. <laughs> uh, he does drive a Volvo. <laughs> this is like a punchline waiting to happen. Volvo is like Linux. That's the standard? I'm going to do it some other kind of way. <laughs> my, uh, my biggest critic for Linux, a really nice guy, he, just, he was Windows Camp 24-7. Um, okay, so one thing I do for my, my intro class um, is that, how am I doing? Good. Uh, one thing I do for my intro class is that I do a survey. And I say, you know, have you used Linux before? <laughs> what distros have you used? Uh, do you know what a command line is? Have you used one? Getting a lot of the basics about my students. Because the one nice thing about curriculum at the start of the semester, it's not written in stone. If you have 95% of your class that all know about Linux, that have all used it at some point, why not up the curriculum? Why, why do you have to teach what you were planning to teach? Why not take into account the students you're teaching? Um, so I like to get information. I have some comments. What, why do you want to learn about Linux? Learn all I need to learn about Linux to make it marketable. I want practical knowledge. This guy, he was in business. Um, he wasn't necessarily focused on Linux as I'm going to use this at work. But when he spoke to people, to vendors, to, to customers, he wanted to be able to speak reasonably about it. That's a great reason to get an education. <laughs> this one's more straightforward. Uh, learn how to utilize Linux. That is what, what uh, excuse me, that is what most hacking software is based in. Um, if you've ever used Backtrack, I, I guess there's a big case to be made for that. But a lot of these guys I have are information assurance people. Um, they want to use tools. They want to they wanna have a basis to be like, oh, um, ext3 is this and tfs is this. Those are things you need to know. No matter what career path you go into in IT, there's always some takeaway you can take or get from uh, each lecture. And this one, uh, this was an ITT tech one. <laughs> uh, better understanding of computer language. That, that's all they put when I asked why they wanted to learn Linux. I'm not sure what that means, but at the, at the end of it, they care at least, right? I didn't get a blank, I didn't, I didn't get a, I have to take this class. Um, that's what they maybe perceived the class to be. Um, so at least I knew that out, out the gate. And maybe I knew from that comment that they may not be as technically savvy as some other people in class by, by, that, by the language of that comment, right? So you can start talking to people that you think might need it more. You can start um, asking people that you know have a background to help other people in class. If you take five weeks to figure out, oh, you're a smart kid in Linux, aren't you? Why waste time? Why not be like, hey, I, I saw that you have experience. I saw that you do this part time. Um, I know there's X, Y, and Z students in the class that could use some extra help. Would you mind helping me mentor those students? Make, make the most out of your class. Take advantage of people that are, that are educated and have a background. Um, so this is just some uh, graphing I did of what I saw. Number of years of experience with Linux. Uh, that huge bar, by the way, is none. Um, so EMU d down there in fall, uh, just under 50% had never used. Um, and then it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty small mixture. ITT Tech, I had no student that had ever used Linux before. Uh, or, I, I'm sorry, that had never used it for um, a year, uh, just less than a year, maybe a couple months, probably in another class. They might have touched it or um, loaded a boot CD or something. And then uh, this winter, uh, 
definitely improving. I, I can't say it's improving because it's not like a linear thing, like the students are learning at some other time. Um, this is just the data I got out of, out of those. But at least when you look at this data, you can maybe see, um, are the incoming students, are they more apt to Linux already? Have they tried it before? With all the, with all the boot cities like, you know, Nopix and Ubuntu, are people getting more of an opportunity to try it before they get to your class? Our yes, <laughs> Zach clearly is. Um, command line interface experience. The yes is gigantic. ITT tech, 100% yes. Uh, DOS, right? Um, so, but you know, it's, it's a great thing, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not one of those Linux, Windows, Mac, you know, budding heads thing. Um, a command line in, a, in most ways is a command line. A lot of, a lot of commands have uh, similar aspects or the way you use the command is similar. And when I have to start doing analogies in class because you have to do analogies to explain technical things to people that aren't apt, right? You start going, okay, well, um, this file system structure. You guys have your C drive. That's like the root partition in Linux. Everything falls under that. You mount the other directories into that root partition. Um, that might not be the most technical thing, and that might not be true in all cases, but for the people that are learning, that's all they need to know. They need to go, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. And primary day-to-day, -day, um, a huge percentage of Windows users, uh, decent smattering Macs, um, that is actually zero. No student uses day-to-day -day Linux that was in my intro class, which makes sense. Um, this is a, a slide I, I really want to put in there. Um, I, I just think it's important to, to break down some preconceived notions that you might have about going into teaching. Um, students are respectful. <laughs> I receive more sir prefix statements in a few semesters than the totality of my life prior. Um, people call me professor, despite me explaining I'm not a professor. And I have a lot more respect for people that can get to a level that they are called professor, um, legitimately. <laughs> uh, telling people to call me by my first name, I'm just Mark in class, I tell them I'm Mark. Uh, they generally default to one of the aforementioned still. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna like, be like, no, don't call me that. But I, I do at the start of the semester, draw the line, I'm Mark, you don't have to call me sir, I'm not a professor, I just put that out there right away. No one so far has really been overtly rude or disrespected. Um, this isn't something I, I guess I, I guess I kind of expected that to maybe happen. Um, going, going into a place like ITT Tech, your student average age is very high, it, it, 30s, 40s, um, compared to, uh, not, not that anyone that's 30 or 40 is old, um, but compared to your, your average college, right? Um, and when I say something in class, people do it and don't question it unless they argue about a quiz answer. Um, there seems like there's no shortage of people that are like, you know, I know you've been doing this for like 11 years, and, but I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think FTP really uses port 20 for anything, so could you, <laughs> I had that in my final and they're like, I don't know what this is. So the worst part's the teaching. It's, it's really hard to see a student that doesn't care. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, you guys are obviously, have, I appreciate your attention and you don't, you don't have to see me more than once. You're here because you want to be, you're here because you think this might be interesting or you might learn something, whatever. Um, students are, a lot of students are there, w whether we want to say it or not, because they do have to be. This might not be their favorite class, this might not even be a class they looked forward to in any regard, but they're still respectful, right? Um, <laughs> keeping track of one-off uh, situations like grades and student issues, you have, it's amazing how many students come up to you for things. I thought that was just some like, when you're a student you don't pay attention to these things. They just happen around you, right? It's like when you get a new car and you're like, holy shit, everyone drives the same car as me. I never noticed that before. It, it's one of those things. Until you're uh, immersed in it, you don't notice. Um, grading, uploading, fixing slides last minute, br ship breaking, network downtime, broken lab machines, so much, so much. Um, uh, the broken lab machines, I, if you guys read my, uh, like little blurb about what I was gonna talk about. I said like how to deal with uh, like 30 students with 27 computers. Um, the answer is half students that have laptops bring their laptop in. <laughs> because lab machines break and when you're already down computers, there's no other option. Um, oh, that one's important to go back to. Getting past the initial wall of curriculum building. Um, <laughs> it, it's a lot of work and it's frustrating work and it's tiring work, but once you get past it, you get to do the awesome part. Uh, feeling like an asshole because someone did poorly on the test. I know I taught them as well as I could. I know a lot of people in the class did really well. I still feel bad. Um, you don't want to see people fail uh, unless you have like some monkey on your back. You don't want to see people fail. And you don't, you don't want, you, more importantly, don't want to see people get frustrated and give up, right? So when, when someone fails, you, you still feel like you didn't do something right. 
Uh, <laughs> this segues in my next quote. Students that don't fully read documents you prepare. This part kills me inside. <laughs> this is just frustrating. Uh, this is regarding a class project. This is my advanced Linux class. This is the second to last week of the semester. So these tests we are doing, um, we have no idea what this software is. Are we supposed to be researching or something? Which could be a fair question, right? If I didn't talk about it in class, maybe they think they missed a lecture or whatever. The purpose of this project is to help transition you from your newly found Knowledge of Linux Systems Administration from read and do to research and implement. It's, it, it's the first sentence of the project. There, there are two paragraphs for the entire project. That hurts, and it's, it's um, this is one of many, many, many situations. Uh, same project, I had a student come up to me and said, all right, we're done with this part, what do we do now? The bottom line of that first section is in bold and it says, when you're done, email me. And it's, it's those kinds of things that you're like, you know, I, I know you're smart, I know you're, 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 you're a good student overall, but why the hell are you not reading these documents? There, there are two sentences or, or two paragraphs. Um, that's, that's one of the far, um, frustrating parts of teaching for sure. <laughs> Best parts of teaching, here we go. Um, the biggest, biggest overwhelming reason why I'm teaching. Um, I love to mentor people. I love conferences for that reason. Um, I love to be that person that's like, I know a guy that knows a guy that knows a guy. I want to get you a job. I want to get you experience. I want to get you this. Um, I, I love, love telling people like, go to conferences. I, you know, we have some students here from Eastern. Go to conferences. Get certifications now. Talk to people now. Don't wait to get your degree and go, someone's going to hire me. And I'm going to get paid like $90,000 out of college. And you know, some people do. And some people have great jobs, but they work their ass off during college to get that, right? Uh, seeing growth in people you spend time helping, that goes for anything in life, but I mean, teaching is one great outlet. It's kind of self-serving, honestly. <laughs> um, sharing your experiences. There, there's not a class that doesn't go by that I don't say at U of M or at Digital Promotions Company or when I was an undergrad. Bring that out and, and let them know you've been through it too, you've seen it, and you want them to experience the best of whatever you can give them. Um, inspiring students to at least try something new. A lot of people hate Linux. Um, I had one student that he was just beasting on Linux the whole semester. Um, end of the semester comes, and he emails me. He says, hey, um, I saw this cool open source project. He didn't know anything about open source before. He's like, I found this on SourceForge, and I want to set up um, like a remote video camera monitoring for my house. He's like, I want to use, li use Linux to do it. And after that, I had like a five or six email back and forth and trying to help him do his kernel stuff and, and, and you know, the video for Linux modules and all that. This guy hated, hated Linux. And now he's using it in his spare time to do a project. That's, that is awesome for someone teaching. Uh, let's see. Uh, having people listen to you, I mean, that, that one's definitely self-serving. It's, it's great to go through something and let people benefit from you, right? Uh, making new friends and colleagues and students. I'm, a lot of my students, I'm you know, Facebook friends. I talk to them outside of class. I, we go get beers. Um, it, you know, it, it's a job, but these are still just people that are talking to you every day. You know, have fun, meet people, network. Um, learning more than you knew about people, education, your own course material. I can't tell you the number of commands I looked up because it's different when you have to do something and tell someone how to do it than it is doing it. Like you can, you can type all the flags you want. Sometimes you type flags and don't even know what the hell they mean in Linux. You're like, I've done this for the last 12 years. I'm just going to keep typing this shit. Um, when, when you do that and students go, why did, why did we type the Z flag with this command? I'm like, I don't know. You don't want that to happen. You, you want to know what you're talking about when you get in there. Um, again, it goes back to the having people take you seriously, all that good stuff. <coughs> Free parking passes. Um, saves a boatload of money for, stu for, uh, for you. I'm in grad school. I'd be there anyways. I'd be paying like $300 uh, a year. Now I get all, that all for free. That's awesome. Um, so my takeaways so far. How am I doing? Good? Sweet. Um, students aren't as apathetic as I was expecting or remember from when I was an undergrad. Um, a, a lot more students than I thought cared. A lot of students that hated Linux um, at the start really took time to learn and, and actually appreciate some aspects at least, right? Uh, being a little bit of a hard ass goes a long way when you're trying to motivate someone. Um, you'll definitely have people that They'll be like, ah, I, I didn't really get it done. Can I get half credit tomorrow? And like, no, you can't. If you want to do the work, do the work. It goes a long way. No matter how much you give students, and this is the other side of it, no matter how much you give students, some just don't give, I mean, they really don't care. Um, you just have to expect that. Command respect, you'll receive it. Um, writing for fresh curriculum is a labor of love for sure. 
uh, be prepared to feel ignored. Not everyone's gonna pay attention all the time. Some people are gonna have a horrible day. Someone's gonna break up with their girlfriend. Someone's gonna be sick. It's not about you necessarily, and if it is, they should tell you that, but it, it, it probably isn't. And don't, don't harp on people just because someone's having a shitty day, right? Ask for feedback. Make yourself a better, better educator. You, you, know, you might have them fill out those end of year reports that only the university seems to get for like two years at a time. It's, ask, ask students. Ask them what you want, or tell them better yet, and I do this in my class, tell them that if they have something they don't wanna tell you, tell the department head. There's nothing I do in class or say in class or don't do in class that I'm ashamed of or, or am worried about. I tell students to openly talk to our department because it's their department, right? I'm just, I'm just there. <laughs> um, hints for you guys if you're looking. Um, ask students to email you everything. It, you would think it would be easier to be like, oh, I'm gonna be out of town this week. Can I take a final this week? Can I? It gets confusing really quick. Um, follow up with your department head. Be the first to act with any problem with a student. Don't wait for them to go to the dean to complain about something that has been a work in progress for days and days and days. Uh, leave your ego at the door. It's not about you. It's just like this conference, what Paul always says, it's not about you, it's about them. Share your experience, but don't share that. You, you were the best Linux admin that ever lived and you guys should bow to me and you know, name a distro after me. And, um, I, I've stated, I, <laughs> Kyle apparently is gonna name one after me. Uh, <laughs> uh, stay with your students as late as you can and not in a questionable way. Um, I, <laughs> I, I wrote that, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it, it's gonna be funny later. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, so, you have situations where students, they lag behind, they come in late. Um, I've stayed as late as two hours after with students that wanted to be there. If someone wants to be somewhere, be there with them, help them. Uh, never make your students don't think, don't come in and talk shit and be like, ah, oh, this is stupid, I wish I could've just stayed at home today, don't, don't do it. <laughs> Uh, be friendly, don't be a pushover. Um, command respect goes back to that. This is my favorite part of the slides, period. Time spent is a lot, a lot greater than the money you're gonna earn. Um, if you do not love teaching and you don't love education, you don't love making people better other than you, just please quit. Don't be that academic that has tenure, that doesn't care about learning, that doesn't care about teaching. So, um, I'm, I'm gonna put these in really quick. Um, Students were doing a project worth 21% of their uh, grade. It's their advanced project. They're all freaking out and hate Linux, right? All your base R belong to us, Echo Wall. <laughs> <laughs> Tux and ASCII art, which is awesome to put out when people are trying to edit Vim and they're like, D, oh God, what's the Vim command? And boom, Tux comes up. <laughs> And I'm, I'm nice too. Um, they had a jacked up uh, Etsy resolve.conf. I fixed it for them. They were really lagging behind. I'm like, here, this is good to go. Next up for me, um, I'm taking this spring summer off. I need time. I, I, but I will be updating curriculum. CentOS 5.5 is about to come out. Our uh, Red Hat Enterprise just came out, 5.5. Um, update labs, like I was saying, box shit out, make sure that people know what's going on. Um, I want to make an uh, Amazon Web Services class. I do a lot of that at work, and I, I you know, the, the cloud, the cloud, the cloud, right? Um, I, it's going to be big, and I think a lot of students out of college might have really good opportunities because they know this stuff. Uh, I'm finishing up my master's December 2011. I'd probably do my doctorate. I, I don't know. I, it's, <laughs> we'll see how I feel. Uh, it's my contact info. You guys can see me around the conference the rest of the week. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, hey, can I take a picture of you guys? They're like, yeah, sure. And then I bubble them. So. Uh, <laughs> so that's it. Uh, probably I might have a minute. I don't know. Anyone have a question off the top of their head? Yeah. Too tough for them, but how do you, you know, you're here mm -hmm. and you expect them to be here. How do I bring people up to a level that they should get to? Yeah, without, without uh, like automatically making them fail just because you said it. Right. Um, everything is 100% building blocks. Um, everything, because of the screenshots, they already know what's going on ahead of time that they should be looking for. Uh, most things are typed out. Type this command, run this command, expect this output. So that, that seems to do a pretty good job. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it.